section five of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Victor, Parts One through Three. Part One. You will ruin his life, said one of the two women. As the phrase escaped her, she remembered or seemed to remember having met with it in half a dozen novels she had nerved herself for the interview which up to this moment had been desperately real but now she felt herself losing grip it had all happened before somewhere she was reacting an old scene going through a part the four or five second-hand words gave her the sensation then she reflected that the other woman too had perhaps met them before in some cheap novelette and being an uneducated person would probably find them the more impressive for that the other woman had in fact met them before in the pages of bow bells and had been impressed by them but since then love had found her ignorant and left her wise wiser than in her humiliation she dared to guess and yet the wiser for being humiliated she answered in a curiously dispassionate voice i think miss his life is ruined already that is if he sent you to say all this to me he did not miss bracy lifted the nose and chin which she inherited from several highly distinguished crusaders and gave the denial sharply and promptly looking her ex-maid straight in the face she had never to use her own words stood any nonsense from bassett but bassett formerly so docile though as it now turned out so deceitful who had always known her place and never answered her mistress but with respect was to-day an unrecognizable basset not in the least impudent but as certainly not to be awed or browbeaten standing in the glare of discovered misconduct under the scourge of her shame the poor girl had grasped some secret strength which made her invincible but i think miss she answered mr frank must have known you was coming and this miss bracy could not deny she had never told a lie in her life it is very likely no it is certain that he guessed she admitted and if so it comes to the same thing bassett persisted with a shade of weariness in her voice you ungrateful girl you ungrateful and quite extraordinary girl first you inveigle that poor boy at the very outset of his career and then when upon a supposed point of honour he offers to marry you a supposed point miss do you say suppose it not one in a thousand would offer such a redemption and even he cannot know what it will mean to his life what it will cost him i shall tell him miss said bassett quietly and his parents what do you suppose they would say were they alive his poor mother for instance bassett dismissed this point silently to miss bracy the queerest thing about the girl was the quiet practical manner she had put on so suddenly you said miss that mr frank wants to make amends on a supposed point of honour don't you think it a real one miss bracy's somewhat high cheekbones showed two red spots because he offers it it doesn't follow that you ought to accept and that's the whole point she wound up 
viciously bassett sighed that she could not get her question answered you will excuse me miss but i never inveigled him as you say that i deny and if you ask mr frank he will bear me out not that it's any use trying to make you believe she added with a drop back to her old level tone as she saw the other's eyebrows go up it was indeed hopeless miss bracy being one of those women who take it for granted that a man has been inveigled as soon as his love affairs run counter to their own wishes or taste and who thereby reveal an estimate of man for which in the end they are pretty sure to pay heavily all her answer now was a frankly incredulous stare you won't believe me miss it's not your fault i know you can't believe me but i loved mr frank miss bracy made a funny little sound high up in her crusader nose that the passions of gentlemen were often ill-regulated she knew it disgusted her but she recognized it as real danger to be watched by their anxious relatives that love however what she understood by love could be felt by the lower orders the people who walked together and kept company before mating was too incredible even if driven by evidence to admit the fact she would have set it down to the pernicious encroachment of board school education and remarked that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing love my poor child don't profane a word you cannot possibly understand a nice love indeed that shows itself by ruining his life that second-hand phrase again as it slipped out the indomitable bassett dealt it another blow i am not sure miss that i love him any longer in the same way i mean i should always have a regard for him for many reasons and because he behaved honourably in a way but i couldn't quite believe in him as i did before he showed himself weak well of all the miss bracy's lips were open for a word to fit this offence when bassett followed it up with a worse one i beg your pardon miss but you are so fond of mr frank supposing i refused his offer would you marry him yourself the girl too meant it quite seriously in her tone was no trace of impudence she had divined her adversary's secret and thrust home the question with a kind of anxious honesty miss bracy red and gasping tingling with shame yet knew that she was not being exalted over she dropped the unequal fight between conventional argument and naked insight and stood up woman to woman she neither denied nor exclaimed she too told the truth never she paused after what has happened i would never marry my cousin i thought that miss you mean it i am sure and it eases my mind because you have been a good mistress to me and it would always have been a sorry thought that i'd stood in your way not that it would have prevented me do you still stand there and tell me that you will hold this unhappy boy to his word he's twenty-two miss my own age yes i shall hold him to it to save yourself no miss for his own sake then miss bracy's laugh was passing bitter no miss though there might be something in that for whose then the girl did not answer but in the silence her mistress understood and moved to the door she was beaten and she knew it beaten and unforgiving in the doorway she turned it is not for your own sake that you persist 
it was not to gratify yourself to be made a lady that you plotted this very well you shall be taken at your word i cannot counsel frank against his honour if he insists and you still accept the sacrifice he shall marry you but from that hour you understand you have seen the last of him i know frank well enough to promise it she paused to let the words sink in and watch their effect this was not only cruel but a mistake for it gave bassett who was past caring for it the last word if you do miss she said drearily yet with a mind made up i dare say that will be best part two long before i heard this story i knew three of the characters in it just within the harbour beside which i am writing this on your left as you enter it from the sea a little creek runs up past battery point to a stout sea-wall with a turfed garden behind it and a low cottage and behind these a steep-sided valley down which a stream tumbles to a granite conduit it chokes and overflows the conduit is caught again into a granite covered gutter by the door of the cottage and emerges beyond it in a small cascade upon the beach at spring tides the sea climbs to the foot of this cascade and great then is the splashing the land birds tits and warblers come down to the very edge to drink but none of them unless it be the wagtail will trespass on the beach below the rooks and gulls on their side never forage above the cascade but when the ploughing calls them inland mount and cross the frontier line high overhead all day long in summer the windows of the cottage stand open and its rooms are filled with song and night and day summer and winter the inmates move and talk wake and sleep to the contending music of the waters it had laid tenantless for two years when one spring morning miss bracy and mr frank bracy arrived and took possession they came for aught we knew out of nowhere but they brought a good many boxes six cats and a complete set of new muslin blinds on their way they purchased a quart of fresh milk and mr frank fed the cats while miss bracy put up the blinds in the afternoon a long van arrived with a load of furniture and we children who had gathered to watch were rewarded by a sensation when the van started by disgorging an artist lay figure followed by a suit of armour from these to a mahogany chest of drawers with brass handles was a sad drop and we never regained the high romance of those first few minutes but the furniture was undeniably handsome and when miss bracy stepped out and offered us sixpence apiece to go and annoy somebody else we came away convinced that our visitors were persons of exceptionally high rank it puzzled us afterwards that though a bargain is a bargain not one of us had stayed to claim his sixpence the newcomers brought no servants but after a week there arrived also out of nowhere an elderly and taciturn cook also miss bracy on the third morning walked up to the farm at the head of the valley and hired down the hinds second daughter for a help we knew this girl lizzie truscott and waylaid her on her homeward road that evening for information she told us that miss bracy's cats had a cradle apiece lined with muslin over pink calico that the window curtains inside reached from the ceilings to the floors that the number of knives and forks was something cruel one kind for fish another for meat and a third for fruit that in one of the looking-glasses a body could see herself at one time from head to feet 
though why you should want a looking-glass to see your feet in when you could see them without was more than she knew and finally that miss bracy had strictly forbidden her to carry tales a behest which convinced that miss bracy had dealings with the evil one she meant to observe the elderly cook when she arrived warned us away from the door with a dialect we did not recognize her name lizzie reported was deborah and in our haste we set her down for a jewess but i seem to have detected her accent since and a few of her pet phrases in the pages of scottish fiction this is all i can tell so fitful are childish memories of the coming of miss bracy and mr frank i cannot say for instance what gossip it bred or how soon they wore down the edge of it and became with their eccentricities an accepted feature of the spot they had made their home they made no friends no acquaintances every one knew of miss bracy's cats but few had seen them miss bracy herself was on view in church every sunday morning when mr frank walked with her as far as the porch he never entered the building but took a country walk during service returning in time to meet her at the porch and escort her home his other walks he took alone and almost always at night the policeman tramping towards four turnings after midnight to report to the country patrol would meet him and pause for a minute's chat night wandering beasts foxes and owls and hedgehogs knew his footstep and unlearned their first fear of it sometimes but not often you might surprise him of an afternoon seated before an easel in some out-of-the-way corner of the cliffs but if you paused then to look he too paused and seemed inclined to smudge out his work the vicar put it about that mr frank had formerly been a painter of fame and being an astute man one day decoyed him into his library where hung an engraving of a picture amos barton by one f bracy it had made a small sensation at burlington house a dozen years before and the vicar liked it for the pathos of its subject an elderly clergyman beside his wife's deathbed to him the picture itself could have told little more than this engraving which utterly failed to suggest the wonderful colour and careful work the artist a young man with a theory and enthusiasm to back it had lavished on the worn carpet and valances of the bed as well as on the chestnut hair of the dying woman glorified in the red light of sunset mr frank glanced up at the engraving and turned his face away it was the face of a man taken at unawares embarrassed almost afraid the vicar who had been watching him intending some pleasant remark about the picture saw at once that something was wrong and with great tact kept the talk upon some petty act of charity in which he sought to enlist his visitor's help mr frank listened gave his promise hurriedly and made his escape he never entered the vicarage again part three eighteen years had passed since miss bracy's interview with bassett and now late on a summer afternoon she and mr frank were pacing the little waterside garden while they awaited their first visitor mr frank betrayed the greater emotion or at any rate the greater nervousness since breakfast he had been unable to sit still or to apply himself to any piece of work for ten minutes together until miss bracy suggested the lawn-mower and brought purgatory upon herself with that lawn-mower all the afternoon he had been rattling her brain to fiddle-strings as she put it and working himself into a heat which obliged a change of clothes before tea 
the tea stood ready now on a table which deborah had carried out into the garden dainty linen and silverware and flowered china dishes heaped with cakes of which only scots women know the secrets the sun dropping behind battery point slanted its rays down through the pine trunks and over the fiery massed plumes of rhododendrons scents of jasmine and of shorn grass mingled with the clean breath of the sea borne to the garden wall on a high tide tranquil and clear so clear that the eye following for a hundred yards the lines of the cove could see the feet of the cliffs where they rested three fathoms down on lily-white sand miss bracy adored these clean depths she had missed much that life could have given but at least she had found a life comely and to her mind she had sacrificed much but at times she forgot how much in contemplating the modest elegance of the altar she wore this evening a gown of purplish silk with a light cashmere scarf about her shoulders nothing could make her a tall woman but her grey hair dressed high a la imperatrice gave her dignity at least and an air of old-fashioned distinction she was one of those few and fortunate ladies who never need to worry about the appearance of their cavaliers mr frank six feet of him without reckoning a slight stoop always satisfied the eye his grey flannel suit fitted loosely but fitted well his wide-brimmed straw hat was as faultless as his linen his necktie had a negligent neatness you felt sure alike and at once of his bootmaker and his shirtmaker and his fresh complexion his prematurely white hair his strong well-kept hands completed the impression of cleanliness for its own sake of a careful physical cult as far as possible removed from foppery this may have been in miss bracy's mind when she began i dare say he will be fairly presentable to look at that unfortunate woman had at least an art of dressing a quiet taste too quite extraordinary in one of her station i often wondered where she picked it up mr frank winced until the news of his wife's death came a fortnight ago her name had not been spoken between them for years that he and his cousin regarded her very differently he knew but while silence was kept it had been possible to ignore the difference now it surprised him that speech should hurt so and at the same moment that his cousin should not divine how sorely it hurt after all he was the saddest evidence of poor bassett's ladylike tastes i suppose you know nothing of the school she sent him to miss bracy went on king william's or whatever it is king edward's mr frank corrected yes i made inquiries about it at the time ten years ago people speak well of it not a public school of course at least not quite the line isn't so easy to draw nowadays but it turns out gentlemen in her heart miss bracy thought him too hopeful but she said he wrote a becoming letter his hand by the way curiously suggests yours it was quite a nice letter and agreeably surprised me i shouldn't wonder if his headmaster had helped him with it and cut out the boy's heroics for of course she must have taught him to hate us my dear laura why in the world began mr frank testily oh she had spirit the encounter of long ago rose up in miss bracy's memory and she nodded her head with conviction like most of the quiet ones she had spirit you don't suppose i imagine that she forgave no mr frank came to a halt and dug with his heel at a daisy root in the turf then using his heel as a pivot he swung himself round in an awkward circle the action was ludicrous almost but he faced his cousin again with serious eyes but it is not her heart that i doubt he added gently 
miss bracy stared up at him my dear frank do you mean to tell me that you regret yes as a fact he did regret and knew that he would never cease to regret he was not a man to nurse malice even for a wrong done to him still less to live carelessly conscious of having wronged another he was weak but incurably just and more though self entered last into his regret he knew perfectly well that the wrong had wrecked him too his was a career manquet he had failed as a man and it had broken his nerve as an artist he was a dabbler now with as hein said of de musset a fine future behind him and none but an artist can tell the bitterness of that self-knowledge had he kept his faith with bassett in spirit as in letter he might have failed just as decidedly her daily companionship might have coarsened his inspiration soured him driven him to work cheaply recklessly but at least he could have accused fate circumstance a boyish error whereas now he and his own manhood shared the defeat and the responsibility yes he regretted but it would never do to let laura know his regret that would be to play the double traitor she had saved him she believed from himself with utterly wrong-headed loyalty she had devoted her life to this the other debt was irredeemable but this at any rate could be paid he evaded her question my dear he said what was done has been atoned for by her and is being atoned for by by us let us think of her without bitterness miss bracy shook her head i am a poor sort of christian she confessed and if she has taught this boy to hate us mr victor bracy announced deborah from the garden porch behind them and a tall youth in black stepped past her and came across the turf with a shy smile the pair turned with an odd sense of confusion almost of dismay they were prepared for the victor but somehow they had not thought of him as bearing their own surname mr frank had felt the shock once before in addressing an envelope but to miss bracy it was quite new yet she was the first to recover herself and while holding out her hand took quick note that the boy had frank's stature and eyes carried his clothes well and himself if shyly without clumsiness she could find no fault with his manner of shaking hands and when he turned to his father the boy's greeting was the less embarrassed of the two mr frank indeed had suddenly become conscious of his light suit and bird's-eye neckcloth but how did you come asked miss bracy we sent a cart to meet you i heard no sound of wheels yes i saw it outside the station but the man didn't recognize me quite a small crowd came by the train and of course i didn't recognize him so i bribed a porter to put my luggage on a barrow and come along with me Halfway up the hill the cart overtook us the driver full of apologies while they transshipped my things i walked on ahead yes listen there it comes and oh i say what a lovely spot miss bracy was listening not for the wheels and not to the story but critically to every word as it came from his lips the woman has certainly done wonders was her unspoken comment at victor's frank outburst however she flushed with something like real pleasure she was proud of her cottage and garden and had even a sort of proprietary feeling about the view they sat down around the little tea-table the boy first apologizing for his travel stains he was in fact as neat as a pin and afterwards chatting gaily about his journey not talking too much but appealing from one to another with a quick deferent grace and allowing them always the lead this is better and better thought miss bracy as she poured tea and after a while 
but this is amazing he was a thorough child too with all his unconscious tact the scent of a lemon verbena plant fetched him suddenly to his feet with his eyes bright please let me he thrust his face into the bush i have never seen it growing like this miss bracy looked at mr frank how utterly different it was from their old maidish expectations they had pictured the scene a hundred times and always it included some awkwardly decorous reference to the dead woman this had been their terror to do justice to the occasion without hurting the poor boy's feelings to meet his sullen shyness perhaps antipathy with a welcome which somehow excused the past yes the past they had felt required excuse to him and he had made no allusion to his mother and obviously wished for none miss bracy could not help smiling at the picture of their fears the boy turned caught her smiling and broke into a jolly laugh at his own absurdity it echoed in the garden where no one had laughed aloud for years and with that laugh bassett's revenge began end of section five section six of the white wolf and other fireside tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kate fallis the white wolf and other fireside tales by sir arthur thomas quiller couch victor parts four through six part four for with that laugh they began to love him they did not or at any rate miss bracy did not know it at the time for some days they watched him and he the unsuspicious one administered a score of shocks as again and again he took them neatly and decisively at unawares he had accepted them at once and in entire good faith they were with just the right recognition of their seniority good comrades in this jolliest of worlds they were his holiday hosts and it was not for the guest to hint just yet at the end of the holiday he surprised them at every turn his father's canvases filled him with admiring awe oh but i say however is it done as he stood before them with legs a trifle wide he smoothed the top of his head with a gesture of perplexity and mr frank standing at his shoulder with legs similarly spread used the same gesture as miss bracy had seen him use it a thousand times yet the boy had no artistic talent not so much as a germ for beauty of line and beauty of colour he inherited an impeccable eye indeed his young senses were alive to seize all innocent delight his quickness in scenting the lemon verbena bush proved but the first of many instances but he began and ended with enjoyment of the artist's impulse to reproduce and imitate beauty he felt nothing mr frank recognized with a pang that he had failed not only in keeping his torch bright but in passing it on that the true self which he had missed expressing must die with him barren and untransmitted the closer he drew in affection the farther this son of his receded receded in the very act of acknowledging his sonship 
with a gesture smilingly imprehensible with eyes which allured the yearning he baffled and tied it to the hopeless chase mr frank who worshipped flowers was perhaps the most ineffective gardener in england with a trowel and the best intentions he would do more damage in twenty minutes than miss bracy could repair in a week she had made a paradise in spite of him and he contented himself with assuring her that the next tenant would dig it up and find it paved with good intentions the seeds he sowed and he must have sown many pounds worth before she stopped the wild expense never sprouted by any chance dormant my dear laura dormant he would exclaim in springtime rubbing his head perplexedly as he studied the empty borders when i die and am buried here they will all sprout together and you will have to take a hook and cut your way daily through the vegetation which hides my grave but victor who approached them in the frankest ignorance seemed to divine the way of flowers at once in the autumn he struck cuttings of miss bracy's rarest roses he removed a sickly passion flower from one corner of the cottage to another and restored it to health within a fortnight within a week after his coming he and miss bracy were deep in cross fertilizing a borderful of carnations she had raised from seed he carried the same natural deftness into a score of small household repairs he devised new cradles for miss bracy's cats and those conservative animals at once accepted the improvement he invented a cupboard for his father's canvases he laid an electric bell from the kitchen beneath the floor of the dining-room so that miss bracy could ring for deborah by a mere pressure of the foot and the well-rope which deborah had been used to wind up painfully was soon fitted with a wheel and balance weight which saved four-fifths of the labour it beats me where you learned how to do these things his father protested but it doesn't want learning it's all so simple not like painting you know mr frank had been corresponding with the boy's headmaster yes he is a good fellow said one of the letters just a gentle clear-minded boy with courage at call when he wants it and one really remarkable talent you may not have discovered it but he is a mathematician and as different from the ordinary book-made mathematician from the dozens of boys i send up regularly to cambridge as cheese is from chalk he has a sort of passion for pure reasoning for its processes of course he does not know it but from the first it has been a pleasure to me an old pupil of ralph's to watch his work style is not a word one associates as a rule with mathematics but i can use no other to express the quality which your boy brings to that study good lord groaned mr frank who had never been able to add up his washing bills he read the letter to miss bracy and the pair began to watch victor with a new wonder they were confident that no bracy had ever been a mathematician for an uncle of theirs now a rector in shropshire and once of emmanuel college cambridge where for reasons best known to himself he had sought honours in the mathematical tripos and narrowly missed the wooden spoon had clearly no claim to the title whence in the world did the boy derive this gift his mother miss bracy began and broke off as a puff of smoke shot out from the fireplace it was late september deborah had lit the fire that morning for the first time since may and the chimney never drew well at starting miss bracy took the tongs in hand but she was not thinking of the smoke 
neither was mr frank while he watched her they were both thinking of the dead woman the thought of her the ghost of her was always rising now between them and her boy she was the impalpable screen they tried daily and in vain to pierce to her they had come to refer unconsciously all that was inexplicable in him and so much was inexplicable they loved him now they stretched out their hands to him behind her he smiled at them but through or across her their hands could never reach as at first they had avoided all allusion to her and been thankful that the boy's reticence made it easy so now they grew almost feverishly anxious to discover how he felt towards his mother's memory they detected each other laying small traps for him and were ashamed they held their breath as with an air of cheerful unconsciousness he walked past the traps escaping them one and all at first in her irritation miss bracy accused him of what she of all women called false pride he is ashamed of her he wishes to forget and is only too glad that we began by encouraging him on second thoughts she knew the charge to be undeserved and odious his obvious simplicity gave it the lie moreover she knew that a small water-colour sketch of her in her youth a drawing of mr frank's stood on the table in the boy's bedroom miss bracy often dusted that room with her own hands and frank she confessed one day he kisses it i know by the dullness on the glass when i rub it she did not add that she rubbed it viciously i tell you she insisted almost with a groan he lives with her she is with him in this house in spite of us she talks with him his real existence is with her he comes out of it to make himself pleasant to us but he goes back and tells her his secrets nonsense laura mr frank interrupted testily for some reason or other the boy is getting on your nerves it is natural after all natural yes i see you mean that i'm an old maid and it's a case of crabbed age and youth my dear laura i mean nothing so rude but after all we have been living here a great many years and it is a change frank you can be singularly dense at times must i tell you in so many words that i am fond of the boy and if he'd only be as fond of me he might racket the house down and i'd only like him the better for it mr frank rubbed his head and then with sudden resolution marched out of the house in search of vicator he found the boy on the roof removing a patent cowl which the local mason had set up a week before to cure the smoky chimney my dear fellow the father cried up you'll break your neck come down at once i have something particular to say to you victor descended with the cowl under his arm do be careful doesn't it make you giddy clambering about in places like that mr frank had no head at all for a height not a bit just look at this silly contrivance choked with soot in three days the fellow who invented it ought to have his head examined it has made you in a horrible mess said his father who took no interest in cowls but lost his temper in a smoky house i'll run in and have a change and wash no put the nasty thing down and come into the garden he opened the gate and victor followed after dipping his hands in the waterfall the fact is my boy i've come to a decision this has been a pleasant time a very pleasant time for all of us we have put off speaking to you about this but i hope you understand 
that this is to be your home henceforward that we wish it and shall be the happier for having you victor had been gazing out over the cove but now turned and met his father's eyes frankly i have a little money he said mother managed to put by a small sum from time to time enough to start me in life she did not tell me until a few days before she died she knew i wanted to be an engineer he said this quite simply it was the first time he had mentioned his mother mr frank felt his face flushing but your headmaster tells me it will be a thousand pities if you don't go to cambridge i am proposing that you should go there should matriculate this term my dear boy he laid a hand on victor's arm don't refuse me this i have no right perhaps to insist but i dare say you can guess what your acceptance would mean to me you can choose your own career when the time comes for your sake your mother would have liked this ask yourself if she would not mr frank had not looked forward to pleading like this yet when it came to the point this seemed his only possible attitude victor had removed his gaze and his eyes were resting now on the green sunny waves rolling in at the harbour's mouth for almost a minute he kept silence then yes she would advise it he said it was as though he had laid the case before an unseen counsellor and waited submissively for the answer mr frank had gained his end and without trouble yet he felt a disappointment he could not at once explain he was the last man in the world to expect a gratitude which he did not deserve but in the satisfaction of carrying his point he missed something and surmised what he missed the boy had not turned to him for the answer but had turned away and brought it to him father and son would never have the deeper joy of taking counsel together heart to heart part five so victor went up to trinity and returned for the christmas vacation on the heels of an announcement that he had won a scholarship he had grown more manly and serious and he smoked a tobacco which sorely tried miss bracy's distinguished nose but he kept the boyish laugh the laugh which always seemed to them to call invitingly from the door of his soul why don't you enter and read me the house is clean and full of good will come but though they never ceased trying they could never penetrate to those inner chambers sometimes though they might be talking of most trivial matters the appeal would suddenly grow pathetic almost plangent what is this that shuts me off from you we sit together and love one another why am i set apart time was when he had seemed to them consciously reticent almost of set purpose but now it was they who looking within the doorway saw the dead woman standing there with finger on lip he made no intimate friends at cambridge yet was popular and something of a figure in his college which had marked him down for high perhaps the highest university honours and was pleasantly astonished to find him also a good cricketer his good looks attracted men they asked his name were told it and exclaimed bracy not the man trinity is running for senior wrangler with this double reputation he might have won a host of friends and his father and miss bracy would gladly have welcomed one in hope that such companionship might exercise the ghost but he kept his way liking and liked by men yet aloof with many acquaintances censorious of none 
influenced by none avoiding when he disapproved but not judging and in no haste even to disapprove easy to approach and almost eager for goodwill yet in the end inaccessible his first easter vacation he spent with a reading party in cumberland there he first tasted the sacred fury of the mountains and mountain climbing and in switzerland the next august it grew to be a passion he returned to it again and again in cumberland playing at the game with half a dozen fellow undergraduates whom he had bitten with the mania but in switzerland during the long vacations giving himself over to a glut of it with only a guide and porter for company sometimes alone if he could ever be said to be alone as in mathematics so in his sport the cold heights were the mistresses he wooed the peaks called to him the rare atmosphere the glittering wastes he neither scorned danger nor was daunted by it below in the forest he would sing aloud but the summits held him silent as an old pastor at zermatt told mr frank he would come down from a mountain like moses with his face illumined he started on his third visit to switzerland early in july and in the second week in august miss bracy and mr frank were to join him at chamonix and thence the three would make a tour together he started in the highest spirits and halted at the gate to wave his ice axe defiantly part six the clergyman who ministered to the little tin english church boarded at the big hotel which kept a bedroom and a sitting-room at his disposal they faced north from the back of the building which stood against the mountainside but the sitting-room had a second window at the corner of the block and from this the eye went up over a plantation of dark firs to the white snow-fields of the col and the dark jagged wall of the aiguille de gaunt distant yet as clear as if stenciled against the blue heaven it was a delectable vision but the clergyman being short-sighted as a mole had never seen it he wore spectacles with a line running horizontally across them and through these he peered at mr frank and miss bracy as if uncertain of their distance mr frank in a suit of black sat at the little round table in the centre of the room pressing his fingertips into the soft nap of a gaudy french tablecloth miss bracy stood by the window with her back to the room but she was listening she too wore black the fourth person at the little clergyman's elbow was christian the guide it was he who spoke while mr frank dug his fingers deeper and the clergyman nodded at every pause sympathetically and both kept their eyes on the tablecloth the pink and crimson roses of which on their background of buff and maroon were to one a blur only to the other a pattern bitten on his brain it must have been between noon and one o'clock the guide was saying when we crossed the coal and began on the rocks i was leading of course the hare next and michel this was their porter behind we had halted and lunched at the foot of the rocks they were nasty with a coating for the most part of thin ice which we must knock away but not really dangerous the hare was silent not singing he had been singing and laughing all through the morning but in high spirits he kept his breath now for business i never knew him fatigued and that day i had to beg him once or twice not to press the pace michel was tired i think and the wine he had taken earlier had upset his stomach 
also he had been earning wages all the winter in england as a gentleman's valet and this was his first ascent for the year so it may have been that his nerve was wrong the first trouble we had with him was soon after starting on the rocks we were roped and at the first awkward place he said if one of us should slip now we are all lost the hare was annoyed as i have never seen him and i too was angry the more because what he said had some truth but it was not you understand the moment to say it after this we had no great trouble until we had passed the place where herr mummery turned back about thirty metres from the summit we came to a bit requiring caution a small couloir filled with good ice but at a slope so here christian held his open hand aslant but mr frank did not lift his eyes they anchored themselves and held me while i cut steps large steps across it on the other side there was no good foothold within length of the rope so i cast off and the hare came across in my steps with michel well anchored it was now michel's turn and having now the extra length of rope brought across by the hare i could go higher to a rock and moor myself firmly the hare was right enough where he stood but not to bear any strain so i told him to cast off that i might look to michel alone while he unknotted his rope i turned to examine the rock and at that instant michel did not understand or was impatient to get it over at any rate he started to cross just as the hare had both hands busy he slipped at the third step i heard and turned again in time to see the jerk come the hare bent backward but it was useless he was torn from his foothold the little clergyman nodded and broke in they were found close together on a ledge two thousand feet below your son sir was not much mutilated though many limbs were broken and his spine and neck the bodies were found the next day and brought down we did all that was possible shall i take you and madam to the grave but the guide had not finished he fell almost on top of michel and the two went spinning down the couloir out of sight i do not think that michel uttered any cry but the hare as the strain came and he bent backwards against it seeking to get his axe free and plant it though that would have been useless the hare cried once and very loud such a strange cry madame will be glad interrupted the clergyman again who had heard christian's story at the inquest madam will be glad he addressed miss bracy who as he was dimly aware had been standing throughout with face averted staring up at the faraway cliffs the young man's last thoughts but christian was not to be denied he had told the story a score of times during the last three days and had assured himself by every evidence that he could tell it effectively he was something of an egoist too and the climax he had in mind was that of his own emotions in recrossing the fatal couloir ropeless with shaking knees haunted by the englishman's last cry such a strange cry he persisted his eyes were on mine for a moment then they turned from me to the couloir and to the great space below it was then he uttered it stretching out his hands as the rope pulled him forward yet not as one afraid mother he cried just that and only once mother mr frank looked up sharply and turned his head towards miss bracy the clergyman and the guide also had their eyes on her the latter waiting for the effect of his climax it must be a consolation to you 
the clergyman began to mumble but miss bracy did not turn mr frank withdrew his eyes from her and fixed them again on the gaudy tablecloth she continued to stare up at the clean ice fields the pencilled cliffs she did not even move so bassett was avenged End of section six. Section seven of the White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The White Wolf and Other Fireside Tales by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Section 7 The Capture of the Burgomeister van der Werf. A Reported Tale of a Dutchman and a Privateer yes a heap of folks have admired that teapot hundreds of pounds we must have been offered for it first and last since the night my wife's grandfather captain john tackabird or captain jacka as he was always called brought it into the family over the back garden wall and his funny little wife went for him with the broom handle poor souls they were always a most affectionate couple and religious too but not much to look at and when he took and died of a seizure in the waterloo year she wasn't long in following ay ay very pleasant in their lives though not what you would call lovely i've heard that through being allowed by his mother to run too soon tackabird's legs grew up so bandy the other children used to drive their hoops between them and next at fifteen what must he do but upset a bee skip a bee stung him and all his hair came off and for three parts of his natural life he went about as bold as an egg to cap everything he'd scarcely began courting when he lost his left eye in a little job with the preventive men but none of this seemed to make any difference to the woman peters her maiden name was mary polly peters a little figure with beady black eyes she believed that all captain jacka's defects would be set right in another world though not to hinder her recognizing him and meantime the more he got chipped about the more she doted on what was left of the man every one in polperro respected the couple for mary polly kept herself to herself and captain jacka was known for the handiest man in the haven to run a guernsey cargo or handle a privateer and this though he took to privateering late in life in the service of the hand and glove company of adventurers by and by mr zephaniah job who looked after these affairs in polperro free trade and privateering both started a second company called the pride of the west and put captain jacka to command their first ship the old pride lugger a very good choice seeing that for three years together he cleared over forty per cent on the adventurer's capital the more was his disappointment when they built a new lugger the unity one hundred and sixty tons and job gave the command to a smart young fellow called dick hewitt whose father held shares in the concern and money to buy votes beside i've told you how jacka swallowed his pride and sailed his mate under this hewitt and how he managed to heap coals of fire on the company's head well that's one story and this is another 
i'm telling now of the second boat when captain jacka or as you might say providence for what happened was none of his seeking and the old boy acted throughout as innocent as a sucking child left off shaming the company as honest men and hit them slap in their pockets where they could feel the bottom of the quarrel was that mr job the agent took a dislike to jacka he was one of your sour long-jawed sort a bit of a lawyer with a temper like old nick and just the amount of decent feeling that makes a man the angrier for knowing he's unjust especially when the fellow that's hit takes it smiling instead of cursing and more especially still when he carries but one eye in his head and be dashed if you can tell whether it's twinkling back at you out of pure sweetness of nature or because it sees a joke of its own i believe captain jacka twinkled back on mr job as he twinkled on the rest of the world willing to be friends and search for the best side of every one if he might be allowed but mr job couldn't be sure of this and i'm fain to admit the old boy was a trial to him with his easy-going ways job you see was a stickler for order kept his accounts like the bank of england all in the best penmanship with black and red ink and signed his name at the end with a beautiful flourish in the shape of a swan all done with one stroke he having been a schoolmaster in his youth and highly respected at it until his unfortunate temper made him shy a child out of window which drove him out of the business as such things will in young dick hewitt he had a captain to his mind soap and tidiness and punctuality and oil and rotten stone for the very gun swivels all the crew touching caps and nerve and seamanship on top of all jacka admired the young spark for all his boastfulness for his own part he could do anything with a ship but keep her tidy what's the use of giving yourself unnecessary work he'd say in his mild manner if he saw one of his hands coiling a rope or housing a sail neatly we may be wantin it any minute and then you'll be sorry for labour thrown away the dirtiness of his decks was a caution and this was the queerer because in his own parlour you might have eaten your dinner off the floor i reckon he'd explain when the lord made sea and land he meant there should be a difference and likewise when he made man and woman and stuck to his untidiness afloat because it made him the gladder to be at home again mary polly though she lived within forty yards of the sea and was proud of her husband as any mortal woman would never step on board a boat the sight of one she declared turned her stomach and she married their only child to a house decorator all this untidiness was poison to mr job and it worked inside the man until he was just one simmering pot of wrath and liable to boil over at the leastest little extra provocation one day it was the tenth of july in the year nine peter's tide and the upper town crowded with peep shows and ranter go rounds and folks keeping the feast mr job takes a stroll down the quay past the sweet standings and cocks his eye over the edge down upon the deck of the old pride that was moored alongside and fitting out for a fresh cruise and there in the shade of the quay wall sat old captain jacka with a hammer tap tapping at a square of tin plate hello mr job hailed where's the crew up riding the hobby horses i believe answered jacka as friendly as you please and in thirty-six hours you've engaged to have the pride ready for sea she's about ready now 
said jacka stopping to put a peppermint in his mouth he had bought a packet off one of the sweet standings and spread it on the deck beside him face day doesn't come round more than once a year and i haven't the heart to deny them with the work so well forward too the old fellow fairly beamed across his deck the raffle of which was something cruel there's a fat woman up there too i'm told she's well worth seeing you call that dirty mass being fit for sea asked mr job nodding down but bottling up his anger after a fashion look here captain tackerbird you're a servant of the company and i'll trouble you to stand up and behave respectful when the company's agent pays you a visit of inspection certainly mr job jack scrambled up to his feet as mild as milk beg your pardon sir i thought you'd just strolled down to pass the time of day and don't flash that plaguey thing in my eyes as you're doing for jacka was standing in the sunshine now with the tin plate in his hands blazing away like a looking-glass very well sir perhaps you'll allow me to fetch a hat out of the cabin for my head feels the heat powerful being so bald they do say it twinkles a bit too when the sun catches it in the right way so down he went to the cabin and up he came again to find mr job with his best coat-tails spread seated on the carriage of the pride's stern chaser oh lord he couldn't help groaning what's the matter nothing mr job nothing the fact was jacka had smeared a dollop of honey on that very gun carriage to keep the wasps off him while he worked the sweet standings you see always drew a swarm of wasps on feast days and the old man never could abide them since his accident with the bee skip mr job sat there with his mouth screwed up eyeing the whole length of the lugger i'd like to know why you were hammering out that tin plate said he i can see with my own eyes you've been knocking dents in the deck but i suppose that wasn't your only object i reckoned to tack it over this here hole in the bulwarks where the tide swung her up against the key end captain jacka showed him the place i'd have let you have a fresh plank if you'd only reported the damage in time oh said jacka a scrap of tin will answer just as well every bit i can't think captain tackerbird how it comes that you've no more regard for appearances just look at the unity for instance and how young hewitt keeps her born different i suppose ay and if you don't look out you'll end different patting a boat with tin mr job let out a rasping kind of laugh but that's polperro all over do you know what they tell about you down to st anne's mr job came from st anne's they say down there that every man-child in polperro is born with a patch in the seat of his mr job stood up and cast a hand behind him to explain i put it there to keep off the wapses said captain jacka but what did he say asked mary polly when her husband brought home the tale first he said i'll make you pay for this well that was fair enough for i ought to have warned him but when i asked the price and where the stuff could be matched for twas his best suit you understand all of a sudden he stamps his foot and lets fly with the most horrible oaths it fairly creamed to my flesh to hear him he's a man of wrath my love and the end of him will be worse than the beginning i dare say but he'll give you the sack before that happens the two poor old souls looked at one another for job had control of all the privateering companies in polperro and influence enough to starve a man out of the place let us take counsel of the lord said the old boy as she knew he would so down on their knees they went and prayed together jacka even put up a petition for mr job but mary polly couldn't say amen to that 
the next morning captain jacka went down to the pride at the usual hour but only to find his crew scrubbing decks and mr job ready for him there's your marching orders says the enemy handing him a paper and if you want a character at any time just come to me and i'll give you a daisy well the old chap said no word but turned about then and there and back along the quay like a man in a dream all the way he kept fumbling the document without daring to open it and when he reached his own door he just sat down on the little low wall outside laid the cursed thing on his knee pulled a bandana out of his breeches pocket and polished the top of his poor head till it fairly blazed in the eye of the sun he was sitting there dazed and quiet when the door opened and out came mary polly with a rag mat in her hand meaning to bang it against the wall as her custom was hello says she stopping short on the threshold back again like a bad penny bad enough this time says her husband without turning round and drops his head with a groan i must say the woman's behaviour was peculiar for first of all she stepped forward and gave his head a stroking just as you might a child's and then she looks up and down the street and says i'm ashamed of ee carrying on like this for all the public to see stick your hands in your pockets says she what's the use of that but he did it now whistle eh whistle a tune but i can't you can if you try i've heard you whistling rule britannia scores of times or bits of it now i'm going to beat this mat and make believe to be talking to e at the very first sound old mrs scantlebury'll poke her head out she always does so you go on whistling and don't mind anything i say there'll be no peace in life for us after she gets wind you've been sacked and just now i want a little time to myself to relieve my feelings so jacka started to whistle feeling mighty shy and mary polly picked up the mat i wish says she to the mat you was mr wang zephaniah wang job wang i do dearly wish for my life you was mr wang zephaniah wang job wang i'd take your ugly old head with its stivery gray whiskers and i'd bang wang i'd bang wang i'd treat you like this here mat and lay you down for folks to wipe their shoes upon mr wang zephaniah wang job wang when britain first at heaven's command whistled jacka and the widow scantlebury two doors up the street was properly taken in an hour later when the news of jacka's dismissal was all over the town she had to sit down and consider i seed him come up the street this was how she told the story being the sort of woman that never knows where the truth ends just as mary polly was shaking out her mat he came up like a whipped dog stuck his hands in his pockets and started to whistle for all the world like a whipped dog you understand any fool could see the man had something on his mind and wanted to break it gentle but not she went on banging the mat if you'll believe me till my flesh ached to see a woman so dull-minded of course it wasn't no business of mine though you would think after living with a man thirty years and so on and so on but when mary polly had relieved her feelings and the two old souls were in the kitchen with the door shut behind them they came very near to breaking down you see captain jacka had followed the trade in pulpero all his days and his heart was in it till mr job pulled him up by the roots he and mary polly had saved a little and looked forward to leaving it to their only child 
my wife's mother that was and anyway it wasn't enough to maintain them let be that to touch a penny of it would have burnt their fingers no captain jacka must find a new billet but in a month or so when folks had given up sympathizing for mary polly hated to be pitied and gave them no encouragement he saw plain enough that there was no billet for him in a small place like polpero where mr job ruled the roost before christmas his mind was made up and early in christmas week he said good-bye to his wife marched up to four turnings with his kit on his back and shipped on board botigo's two-horse conveyance for falmouth there was a mr rogers living at falmouth who had been a shareholder in the old hand and glove company but had sold out over some quarrel with mr job and to him jacka applied i'm told that seamen are scarce sir says he i was wondering if you could find me a berth anywhere for i've earned forty per cent for my employers before now and could do it again but for a man of my unfortunate looks tis hard to get a start mr rogers tapped the desk with his ruler like one considering why have they turned you out he asked anything professional how could i help mr job sitting down on a lump of honey i put it to you sir as a business man i'm sure i don't know said mr rogers let's have the story so out it all came he's a man of wrath said captain jacka and he'll be sorry for it when he comes to die there's one or two said mr rogers would like to hurry that reckoning a bit well well i can make shift to fit you up with something for a week or two and maybe by that time there'll be an opening aboard one of the packets just now in christmas week business is slack enough but what do you say to going mate on a vessel as far as the downs nothing i should like better says jacka you'd better have a look at her first says mr rogers so he takes jacka off to the market strand calls for a waterman's wherry and inside of ten minutes they were being pulled out to the roads there's your ship says mr rogers as they pushed out beyond the old dock into carrick roads jacka opened first his eyes and then his mouth the vessel was a kind of topsail schooner but with a hull there was no mistaking the more by token that the tide was swinging her stern on and showing him a pair of windows picked out in red paint with shutter boards and brass hinges shining mr rogers he said i hain't read the sherborne mercury lately but is is the war over no nor likely to be but mr rogers sir either that there ship is a dutchman or else i be look at her flag you old fool never seed the like of it that's the flag of the principality of nibby ever heard of it can't say i have no more did i till the day before yesterday and i won't swear i've got it right yet but tis somewhere up the baltic i understand that there ship her name by the way is the burgomeister van der Werf, is bound up channel with sugar from jamaica with a license maybe you folks up to polpero don't know what that means i only know that if i'd ran across her in the old pride i'd have clapped a crew on board and run her into a british port no questions asked says mr rogers if that's the way you polpero men keep abreast of board of trade regulations it strikes me you might have done worse than lose your billet with the pride of the west in the time left before the waterman brought them alongside mr rogers explained as well as he could the new system as it was then of licenses by which the government winked at neutral vessels carrying goods into the enemy's ports in spite of the blockade and bringing us back baltic timber for shipbuilding but a dutchman isn't no neutral captain jacka objected i did hear 
said mr rogers stroking his chin and looking sideways that these licenses have their market price and that in amsterdam just now it's seven hundred rix dollars well well if the board of trade's satisfied says jacka it's not for the likes of me to object but if i was a christian ruler i should think twice afore invitin such a deal of hard swearin you'll find captain cornelis a lutheran mr rogers assured him and a very sociable fellow with the little english he can muster well to make my story short jacka stepped on board and found the dutch skipper monstrous polite and accommodating though terrible sleepy the reason being that his mate falling sick at kingston of the yellow fever he had been forced to navigate his vessel home single-handed he owned up too that he had a poor head for ciphering so that twas more by luck than good management he'd hit off the channel at all at any rate he was glad enough of a chance to shift off responsibility and take a sound nap and inside of half an hour the bargain was struck over a glass of hot schnapps mr rogers shook hands and put off for shore again and a boat went with him to fetch jacka's kit which he'd left in the office at six o'clock the van der Werf weighed anchor and headed out under easy canvas the wind outside was almost dead contrary east by north and half east and blowing a little under half a gale but the skipper seemed in a hurry and jacka didn't mind she's a good boat by all seeming said he as they cleared st anthony's light but she wants a seaway i reckon sir you'd better stay on deck for a tack or two till i find how she comes about i'm accustomed you see to something a bit sharper in the bows and just at first that may tempt me to run it too fine who wants you to run it fine at all asked captain cornelis well naturally you'll work it in short tacks and hug the english side pretty close short tacks not a bit of it tide'll be running up strong by time we're out in deep water put her right across for france keep her pretty full she won't bear pinching and let her rip risque how's that shaw's marie's a pretty thick i'm told once you get to other side especially between morley and guernsey let alone a chance of dropping across a french cruiser my good man i've been stopped twice on this voyage already by french cruisers once off brest and the second time about fifty miles this side of ushant you don't tell me says jacka how the dickens did they let you go well answers the dutchman i took the precaution of fitting myself with two sets of papers oh says he as jacka lets out a low whistle it's the ordinary thing in our line of business so you just do as i tell you and make the boards as long as you please for i'm dropping with sleep in my boots keep the ship going and if you sight any one that looks like trouble just give me a hail down the companion for i can talk to any frigate british or french with that he bundled away below and jacka after a word or two with the man at the helm to make sure they understood enough of each other's lingo settled down with his pipe for the night's work the wind held pretty steady and the van der Werf made nothing of the cross seas being a beamy craft and fit for any weather in a seaway jacka conned her very carefully and decided there was no use in driving her extra sail would only fling up more water without improving her speed so he jogged along steady keeping her full and by and letting her take the seas the best way she liked them towards morning he even began to doze a bit till warned by a new motion of the ship that she wasn't doing her best he opened his eyes and shouted up with your helm ye lubber hard up i tell you and keep her full a pretty heavy spray at that moment came over the bow and took him fair in the face and he stumbled aft in none too sweet a temper then he saw what had happened the fresh hand at the wheel had dozed off where he stood and let the van der Werf run up in the wind the fellow was little more than a boy and a white in the face with want of sleep 
captain jacka was always a kind-hearted man said he as he flung the spokes round and the van der Werf began to pay off look here my lad if you can't keep a better eye open i'll take a trick myself so go you forward and stow yourself somewheres within call with that he took the helm and glad of it to keep himself awake and so held her going till daybreak by eight in the morning just as the light began creeping and jacko was calculating his whereabouts he lifted his eye over the weather bow and hello he sings out what's yonder to windward the lad he'd relieved jumps up from where he'd been napping beside the bits and runs forward but whatever he sang out jacka paid no attention for by this time his own one eye had told him all he wanted to know and a trifle more and he clutched at the wheel for a moment like a man dazed then i believe a sort of heavenly joy crept over his face mixed with a sort of heavenly cunning call up the crew he ordered i'm going to put her about the whole crew every man jack of them by the time the men tumbled up jacka had his helm up and the van der Werf, with sheets pinned was leaning to it and knocking up the unholiest sputter all right my lads don't stand glazing at me like stuck pigs stand by to slacken sheets i'm going to jibe her well they obeyed though not a man of them could guess what he was after over went the big mainsail with a jerk that must have pitched captain cornelis clean out of his bunk below for half a minute later he comes puffing and growling up the companion and wanting to know in his best dutch if this was the end of the world and if not what was it that's capital said jacka for i was just about stepping down to call you see that lugger yonder he jerked his thumb over his shoulder at a speck in the grey from which the van der Werf was now running at something like nine knots an hour. Well? I know that, Lugger, and we're running away from her. Pack of stuff, said Captain Cornelis, or Dutch to that effect. Do you want to be told a dozen times that this is a licensed ship? And he called for his flag to hoist it oh drop your fancy pocket handkerchiefs and listen to reason that's a dear man of course i know you carry a license but the point is the lugger don't know of course i'm running away from her by your leave but the point is she can run and reach three miles to our two and lastly of course you're master here and can do what you please but if you're not pressed for time there's money in it and you shan't say i didn't give you the chance captain cornelis eyed jacka for a full minute and then a dinky little smile started in one eye and spread till it covered the whole of his wide face you're a knowing one said he was never considered so answered jacka very modest she's put about in after us said the skipper after a long stare over his right shoulder she'll have us in less than three hours there's one thing to be done and that's to stow me somewheres out of the way for if any one on board of her catches sight of me the game's up suppose we try the lazarette if you have such a place i like fresh air as a rule but for once in a while i don't mind being squoze and as lazarettes go yours ought to be nice and roomy you shall have a bottle of hollands for company promised captain cornelis so the hatch was pulled up and down jacka crept and curled himself up in the darkness the dutchman provisioned him there with a bottle of strong waters and a bag of biscuits and what's more called down to him so long as was prudent and kept him informed how the chase was going by this time the lugger which i needn't tell you was mr zephaniah job's pet unity with captain dick hewitt commanding was closing down on the van der Werf, overhauling her hand over fist. Down in the lazarette, Jacka had scarcely finished prizing the cork out of his bottle of Hollands when he heard the bang of a gun. This was the lugger's command to round to and surrender, 
and the old boy who had been vexing himself with fear that some cruiser might drop in and spoil sport put the bottle to his mouth and drank mr job's very good health for i think says he to himself with a chuckle i can trust captain dick hewitt to put his foot into this little mess just as deep as it will go with that being heavy after his night's watch he tied up his chin in his bandana handkerchief to keep him from snoring curled round and dropped off to sleep like a babe well sir captain de Hewitt brought to his prize as he reckoned her and when he came aboard and sized up the cargo and the unity's luck as he reckoned it his boastfulness was neither to hold nor to bind no such windfall had been picked up for the pride of the west during the four years he'd been in the company's service he scarce stayed to give a glance at the vanderwerf's papers though captain cornelis was ready for him with the wrong set i guess says he you'll spare yourself the trouble to pretend you ain't a dutchman and when the skipper flung his arms about and began to jabber like a play-actor twas a right mine here we'll talk about that at Falmouth. look here boys he sings out to his boarding party we've something here too good to be let out of sight my idea is to reach back for polperro in company and let mr job and the shareholders have a view of her before taking her round to falmouth it won't cost us three hours extra says he and a little bit of flourish is excusable under the circumstances so up for polperro they bore half a dozen men from the lugger working the vanderwerf and old captain jacka asleep in her lazarette till roused out of his dreams by the rattle as they cast anchor half a cable's length outside the haven the tide was drawing to flood and the evening dusking down and in sails captain dick in the unity as big as bull's beef and shouts his news to all the loafers on the quay but come and take a look at her for yourself says he to mr job who had stepped down with his best telescope job put off that evening in something like a flutter of spirits for to tell the truth half a dozen of the shareholders had been cutting up rough over his treatment of jacka and here was an answer for them and proof that he'd been right in preaching up de Hewitt to be worth ten of the old man alongside he comes in the unity's boat steps aboard and makes a polite leg to captain cornelis with any amount of sham sympathy in his eyes dear dear says he this is a very unfortunate business for you captain what's your name in time of war i suppose such things must happen but i can't help feeling sorry for you says he i was thinking to reckon the damage at six hundred pounds says the dutch skipper meek as you please hey says mr job well sir i likes to be reasonable but it's a question of missing the convoy and under the circumstances case of illegal detention at the best you won't consider six hundred pounds out of the way of course says he i haven't been allowed to study your lugger's papers so it may be flat piracy but if your skipper had taken the trouble to study mine what in thunder is he telling about demanded mr job only this sir answered captain cornelis smiling very sweet and pulling out his license from his side pocket he read and the said vessel has our protection while bearing any flag except the french and notwithstanding the documents accompanying the said vessel and cargo may represent the same to be destined to any neutral or hostile port or to whomsoever such property may appear to belong the wording you see sir is very particular and under the circumstances i can't say less than six hundred pounds but of course if you oblige me to take it to the courts there's your papers to be considered which may raise the question of piracy 
just an hour later when mr job had returned to shore in the devil's own temper to call a hasty meeting of his shareholders and captain hewitt along with him with his tail between his legs captain cornelis raised the trap of the lazarette i'm thinking a little fresh air's no more than you deserve said he but where are we in this world asked jacka so well as i can learn tis a place called pulpero jacka chuckled seen anything of a party called job he's to bring me six hundred pounds before morning answered the dutchman lighting his pipe and see here i'm a fair dealin man and i own i owe you a good twenty of it you shall have it when you leave the ship and i'll chance making it right with the owners very good for you to be sure allowed jacka but that isn't all i owe you something on my own account and if there's any small favour i can do you and reason well since you put it so friendly i'd like an hour or so ashore ashore what to-night it's my home you see jacka explained and my old woman lives there you don't say so well you shall be put ashore as soon as you please anything else i seed a very pretty teapot and sugar basin in your cabin yesterday i don't know if you set any particular store by them but if you don't my old woman's terrible fond of china and you can deduct it out of the twenty pounds if you like shouldn't think of it says captain cornelis their best nankin and they're yours anything else well if i might ask the loan of a pair of your breeches till to-morrow they seem to me a bit fuller in the seat than mine and let alone being handy to carry the china in they be a kind of disguise for to tell the truth i don't want to be seen in pulpero streets to be mixed up with this business and my legs be so bandy that in any ordinary small clothes there's no mistaking me even in the dark so the van der Werf's boat landed jacka that night in pitch darkness half a mile west of the haven where a ridge of rock gives shelter from the easterly swell and just half an hour later as mary polly turned in her sleep she heard a stone trickle down the cliff at the back of the cottage and drop thud into the yard under her window she sat bolt upright in bed there's some villain of a thief after my minorca's eggs said she another stone trickled and fell like the woman of spirit she was she jumped out of bed crept downstairs to the kitchen picked up the broom and listened with her hand on the latch of the back door she heard the scrape of a toe plate on the wall outside this was too much you mean sneakin snivellin pilferin egg stealin highwayman cries she and lets fly well sir the sugar basin was scat to atoms but the teapot as you see didn't suffer more than a chip the wonder was she stayed her hand at the second stroke old jacka being in no position to defend himself or explain in later days when she invited her friends to tea she used to put it down to instinct something warned me she'd say but that's how the teapot came into our family End of section seven.